Okay, welcome back everyone to another episode of the Global AI Podcast. We're hosting from down under in Australia where apparently the world is just ending with everything that's going on at the moment, but at least we've got a little podcast to keep the morale high. Um, my name's Akansha. It's been a while since I've been hosting and I'm back again in front of the cameras. So welcome back. Um, I'm an AI MVP down here in Melbourne and I've got a fabulous co-host with me. Zoe, if you want to do a quick introduction to yourself. So, sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining again for another episode of our podcast. As I can't mentioned, my name is Somi, and I'm excited to be here and to be speaking to two of our student and best Microsoft student ambassador this afternoon, this evening, or this morning, wherever you're joining from. Actually, let's just kick off that way with that. So why don't we jump in and get them to do introduce themselves and maybe talk a bit about how they've kind of ended up in this whole world of AI. Uh, Rodan, did you want to take it away first? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Rodan Elixiu, uh, and I am from Greece. Uh, I am a computer science student, so I really wanted to be involved in a, in a computer science um, world. And uh, through my uh, experience from the Microsoft Lesson Ambassador, I um, w I had the chance to work with AI tools, learn more about uh, how we can implement this in our everyday life or in bigger uh, projects. Uh, so like I'm, I'm, I'm a third year student, so the last two and a half years, I I learned um, about different tools, especially um, relating to uh, Microsoft um, AI tools uh, that could um, help me create beautiful projects and also um, make me understand better what the world needs um, and how AI can help with that. So this it was a beautiful process. That was a fabulous way to describe it and like much more eloquent than I ever was in third year of college um, and I feel like this is going to be the exact same case with Usman as well where he's going to be like in college doing all the things that we never did uh, so Usman do you want to do an introduction to yourself as well please okay uh, can you guys hear me <clears throat> okay, so um, everyone, I'm Usman Khan, and I'm really, you can say, happy to be here. And a bit, in, a bit of introduction from myself on the educational side would be that I'm a final year student at National University of Modern Languages, Islamabad, uh, Pakistan, and I'm doing bachelor's in computer sciences. And I chose computer sciences because. I was, you can say, the guy who was good with computers. So I thought that I should go into computer sciences initially. I didn't know that what I was diving into, but I did know the high level understanding of what I was about to become. So uh, as far as my professional life is concerned, I started my career as a machine learning engineer. Uh, it all started way back in 2019. And I've been, you can say, I've been a guy who couldn't find the right tool for himself. I was a guy who would like learn different languages and then wouldn't know what to do with it. And then um, one day I decided that I wanted to change the world. And then I decided what tool would be the best way to do that. So eventually I landed on machine learning and AI, and I thought this is the thing which can enable me to bring the change to the world. I'm not just building uh, software which will help organization. At the end of the day, I am building a uh, better, uh, you can say, uh, a tool that can help someone, a tool that can help the humanity in any way possible. That's the motivation behind me moving into ML. And then after, like for the past three years, I've been working in ML and my main area of expertise has been NLP, natural language processing, which deals with all of the text that is uh, being uh, like, uh, you can say held in AI. So I'm like handling all of those things. And other than that, uh, 
I've recently been really intrigued towards what I will do in the upcoming, you can say, uh, five to 10 years. So I've decided to move a bit sideways towards data engineering and on the cloud especially. So uh, my plan is to move sideways to data engineering and then move upwards towards managing the entire data pipeline, which includes machine learning, data engineering, data science, and all of these inclusive. And other than that, I personally think that certifications do not matter a lot, but just to put it out there, I have uh, seven X uh, I have seven X certifications in Microsoft Azure. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer and I'm NLP certified and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I personally believe that skills matter more than the certifications, but they are good to have. Like when you're uh, making your career in something, these are good milestones that keep you like motivated to your cause. So other than that, uh, that's I think about it from my introduction. I think that was a lot. That was awesome and very impressive. Uh, well done. <laughs> I don't think that I achieved yeah. as much as you did in your <laughs> university time. I would never. And um, I didn't like, like just grab the point that you two mentioned about the motivation to try to use AI to make it make a better world. I would say so to use it in a better fashion. It's not just about like serving organization. It's about serving, helping people to like improve their lives on a day to day basis. That is great. So on that note. Maybe we can start with you, Osman. Can you tell us a little bit about your AI project? Uh, what was it about? And maybe get to a little bit of technical side of it. What was it involved? You mentioned that you had to learn different languages, or you are a guy that learned different languages and then see which one you can use where. So maybe if you can okay. give us like a couple of examples on one or two recent projects that you worked on, and then we'll ask the same question from Radan as well. OK. So uh, I did many projects in the past, but one that I would highlight is the one that I did for uh, an organization, which involved, uh, you can say, human computer understand, a human computer interface at CI. What that project specifically did was, uh, since you all might know, we're bombarded with uh, all of the content that is continuously being posted online, and sometimes it is uh, overwhelming. And so, what we did was we developed uh, a platform which would summarize the things what you needed the most. So let's suppose you're on Medium, you're reading a bunch of articles and you're in your office and you just decided to scroll through a few of the articles. Like each article is usually 500 words and you are just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling and your boss is looking at you like, really, man? And so uh, in order to uh, save your time and your voice time and... This is just a general example. That's not exactly the case. I'm just putting out there. Anyhow, uh, so what we did was we uh, made a platform which would present summarized version of articles and all of the like textual material to you at your uh, mobile phone and your own website. Uh, like let's suppose you have a uh, 1,000 words article and you don't have the time to read through all of that article. So what we did was we presented a 50 to 60 words uh, summary, which would summarize the entire article and present it to you so that you get the entire idea of uh, what is being said in that article. And eventually it will save a lot of your time. Uh, like in five minutes, if you were to read uh, two articles uh, in our platform, you would be able to read uh, 20 to 30 articles in the same time. And if you wanted to still uh, read the original article, you can still go to the original author and read the entire article. And this was achieved through three technologies mainly. Uh, the first one was uh, Python and it's, a, you can say, I wouldn't call it a framework, but an architecture which is called BERT. It's a deep learning uh, neural network and it's based off of, uh, you can say, I know I'm getting a bit too technical, but it's based off of a new architecture that was presented. It's similar to LSTMs, and uh, it's a really good architecture. It's a, like all-in-one uh, tool. So uh, we used that, and we deployed that through Microsoft Azure. And we uh, used uh, Flask to serve it as an API 
and that was then integrated to our website and then same api was integrated to our mobile app so that was the overall um, project i hope i didn't get too much technical i tried to say as non technical as possible no it was it was good it was good enough that get me excited to just look up and see what it is that new framework that you just spoke about um how about yourself rodanti what was the recent project or air project that you've worked on actually um my first project my my personal projects they want that i want to uh they want that i do in order to learn the tools and perhaps even present them uh through the ambassador program are more for my everyday uh, life in order to better understand the problem and then i can i can implement it but my biggest project that i was very very happy to be involved in was um actually a year ago uh it was 6 months into the uh into uh the program um and it, we i was part of the team that um created the learn documentation for the azure health bot so the um how we can use like ai through this bot to help health organizations um uh utilize the the their um capabilities and they could um better serve their customers the and also the health workers at the same time uh so i was very happy for um a few months to work with this incredible team from with other ambassadors and with our mentor Lee Scott that uh, we could an- understand how we can create first of all this this bot um that could um help um perhaps uh, a covid patient for example uh have all their necessary information concerning a uh, consider um concerning their um if they need treatment or if they um need to stay at home and just um be um be careful f- not to infect anyone uh, have all the um ra- uh, right information and thus um not have any problems with misinformation that happens sadly uh, sadly uh, in the um health area especially during covid so um through this project that we could understand how this bot works this ai tool works uh we rewrote the documentation and then we also um researched how actual organizations uh, could use this uh tool in order to improve their services and serve their customers and self the citizens better um it was it was actually one of the most interesting projects that i was in because it was a problem that we were f- facing uh because of covid because of we, we we all had been in a situation where we wanted information or we wanted to know uh the right treatment and with a very simple ai tool we could do that so it was my first experience with um a, a larger project uh that I, I was also very happy to be part of a team to create to uh work with this project uh it also helped me understand the steps that i have to take in order to um learn and understand different tools and how to implement them so first per- perhaps read the documentation and then um go through step by step uh, first understand the problem um and then um go through the implementation phase and then um how actually this could be um used by real life uh, actors so it was very it's very it was a very interesting experience a, w- for a real life problem um i guess oh god sorry i'm just like am i just going to spend this whole podcast and just sitting here in like amazement of everything you've been doing cuz this is just <laughs> wild <laughs> but i guess like in a, in that context like what was the hardest parts that you faced i guess going through it maybe without people we'll start with you cuz you've just been talking about it like what was the heart like the challenges that you kind of came across as you're building these out especially given that this is just in the middle of college i'm just like wow amazing but yeah talk to me about how how you felt going through it um it was very interesting because um of course i was only uh 
it was my second year in college, uh, in university, so I didn't have all the theoretical um, AI knowledge yet. Um, so f for me, it was at the beginning, okay, okay I, I want to create this bot. Uh, wh what are the steps that I have to follow? I was lucky because I was part of the team, so if I had any issue or, or if I had any problem or I didn't know what I was... Um, uh, what what the code uh, was doing or for uh, if the my implementation was right i could just ask my um my fellow like uh, student ambassadors or our mentor or or in our weekly calls um i had any challenges that i had in the technical aspect because i did not have the theoretical um knowledge beforehand um i at the beginning i was i could overcome them and then later um like finish the project and everyone could understand all the steps that we have to follow to implement this this bot um so for me it was mostly technical to actually understand how we can use this for different scenarios and um how this could uh, work if um, we didn't use it only for COVID, but also for other um, health-related issues. Um, so, but it was also I, I always want to think of, uh, think about it like a challenge that I was very happy that I was part of the team that it could overcome this challenge. So it was um, a nice challenge because I learned things from that from this experience, and then uh, I learned also how to move past it and. Uh, of course, ask for help and ask for um, guidance. I think there's so much to be said about learning from within the team. And I think there's never, well, there's never really a time that you don't learn from a team, but there's never a better time to do that, especially when you're starting into your career. Um, Usman, I will throw it over to you. What about yourself? How, what did you find to be kind of the hardest part of it all? Okay, so like the biggest challenge, right? Uh, I'm already. Okay, uh, so I considered two major things, which were like one of the biggest, not one, two of the biggest challenges that I faced in my entire, you can say, career. Uh, one of them was uh, organizations and people's. Uh, people not understanding that a student can do this much and making them understand that yes we are capable and a young person can do that as well because initially when i started there were times then uh, when i was sitting beside to a, a very uh, you can say senior person and i duly respect them uh, and there was something uh, which i had better you can say uh, perspective on. I have I had things to say which uh, would have been better if uh, I had to implement them because I recently uh, learned all of those new architectures and everything. Meanwhile, that senior person was still using the old frameworks and everything, but uh, the organizations were still not uh, convinced that they should let a young person to uh, make key decisions and like do something and uh, like uh, to cut things short uh, the organizations wouldn't put trust in a student and a young person uh, that they can do something so that was my biggest challenge and over the time I have come like I have overcome that challenge because because I have been able to prove to people and to organization and to myself as well that I am capable and I do not need to be graduated to prove that I can do something. And I do not need other people's validation that I can do something. So that was really like challenging part. And it was something which if I got caught up in that, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I would have been like the typical guy who just graduates and finds an internship and then starts his career by the age of 30 and 25. So I'm really grateful that I got to uh, go past that challenge. And the second one was imposter syndrome. As I said, I was a student and I started off with all of these things. I There were times when I felt that I 
well, I didn't belong here. I was living in a bubble that could burst at any moment. But it is, I eventually learned that it's all a phase of your life, whether you're a professional or a student or whoever you are, it's a phase of life. And it happens with the best of us. And I eventually got to accept that. And I made peace with myself. And I, I still do have oh, imposter syndrome sometimes, but I have tried to overcome it. So these two were my biggest challenges that I faced. That is very interesting. You kind of tackle it in the both from both sides, like technical being in a new environment, trying to improve yourself, not to trying to convince other people that you know enough to do the job uh, when you're sitting next to the senior person. So that is the biggest challenge. I guess it's like joining a new company. So you have to like prove that you're good. But I guess for students coming to the market, that is like a bigger challenge with not having experience on the paper that is hard to kind of prove. And I guess the way that you managed to overcome with it, that was good and it's a good lesson learned for all of us. Uh, but I want to ask like a different quiz kind of question. If I want to get into the field of AI, maybe it's more of a, like a technical question. What is What are the key skills that I need to learn to get myself into the right track? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Roland T. Um, so if I'm new to AI and ML, I heard a lot about it. I'm excited, but I don't know where to start. What do you reckon that will be a good path for me to, to get start that journey? Um, from my personal experience, uh, because I studied computer science, so I, I am um, in this computer science world. But at the same time, uh, the, the projects that I I did for with related to AI were not uni related. So my experience was um, start by watching YouTube videos, start by um, learning uh, a, a language that you are comfortable with. For me, um, it was Python. Even though in the university we didn't, uh, we haven't already learned that. It was um, mostly C, C++. So just by it, it, it can be overwhelming, but it's also a very interesting experience to learn those tech skills, for example, Python by yourself or the first, um, uh, the easiest um, um, steps for, to learn the language are, are, are okay. Um, and then f for me, it was also um, like, um, read the documentation of the tools that you want to use. It's it's incredibly important to um, understand the tool that you are working with, even if it's a Python library or if it's um, a tool. Um, for example, I've used uh, several tools uh, from um, Microsoft Azure, so I had to read all the documentation of how um, we can uh, use it and what other people, uh, the problems that other people had um, and how to overcome them very, very soon and not face them also by myself uh, to, um, um, doing the project. So it was mostly um, great simple projects not like for yourself so an automation uh, project or a simple bot um, with a, a language that you're comfortable with for me it was python for ai um, and then um, create uh, projects um, step by step in order to understand what each step does so the output uh, in this case um, and then move on to more um, to projects that can be useful for um, for an everyday problem, but because if you don't face this problem and you cannot see the result of your project, then it's not easier for you to um, uh, to work on it, like to, to improve it. So, for my personal advice is um, know some basic tech skills and then work on projects that can implement it in your everyday life uh, even fun projects that doesn't have to be um a project that will uh solve a very major um issue uh but um work with um work with the tools that are out there are in like everywhere youtube documentation 
uh, from everywhere that you can find and create simple at the beginning uh, projects and then move on to um, bigger ones because you would have understand how everything works and the challenges that you may face and how you overcome them. That, that is correct. I'm 100% with you on that one. Start with the small steps and then maybe trade and move on to the more complex project. Mm -hmm. It will make the journey more enjoyable, I would say, and exciting at the same time as well. How about mm -hmm. you, Usman? What is your advice on that? I actually absolutely agree with her, and especially the self-learning part. It's absolutely crucial. And like I myself have been self-learning from the start as well. Uh, there are some things that I would add to that. Um, you can say I would split this into two parts. One is the learning part and the other one is what you do. So in the learning part, I personally think there are five things that you need to take care of. And uh, the very first thing is motive behind uh, going into AI. Like, why do you want to do it? You need to have a good, you can say, it's not must, but it it's better, it'll help you in the longer run. Like, why do you want to do AI? You should, it should be well-defined in your mind. You do not need to write it anywhere. You just need to know it yourself. And then the programming part, uh, chances are if you uh, like graduated from a college, uh, you have all the prerequisites met. But since, uh, let's suppose you're a self-learner uh, who hasn't gone to college and you're uh, like learning off of YouTube. So I would suggest, uh, building solid programming foundations start off with any programming language it doesn't matter you start off a uh, c plus plus uh, python i would say that just don't start with html start with anything else html is not programming language by the way so uh, then move on to some complex topics such as uh, data structures and algorithms and then eventually move on to all of the other things and then uh, comes the maths part. Third thing is maths. Obviously, if you graduated in your college, uh, I know uh, like none of us uh, like maths that much, but it is required in AI. Uh, so uh, if you've done uh, your graduation, chances are that all of the maths you need is already like uh, done in your college level. But if you're a self learner, uh, do build a strong foundation in linear algebra and all sorts of things and then move towards a specific framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow or any other thing that you want and then uh, choose a domain. Like you want to go towards uh, computer vision, reinforcement learning, NLP, whatever you want, just go towards that. And as far as the doing part is concerned, uh, it's a simple thing. Uh, do as much as projects as uh, Ranti also uh, uh, like said. Uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, and do as much as uh, projects as you want in small steps. Do not overwhelm yourself with building the next Tesla. Uh, do simple projects, uh, just like she said, uh, automation projects and those sort of things. And do not get lost in the course uh, syndrome. I would, co I have like uh, made a term called course syndrome. This is for those people who just keep on doing courses, courses and courses uh, with the and they gather certificates and they do not implement anything. So do not be one of those people. Uh, it's good to do courses, obviously do your course, but then implement it as well so that you solidify your understanding of that. But there are some people who just do courses, get certificates, post it, then repeat the whole process. They don't end up doing anything practical. So uh, they, the one getting hurt by the end of this process is you. So do not go into that uh, pit and just implement and everything will come into place eventually. So that's uh, what I think that are the key skills in learning and getting into the field of care. That is perfect. I think um, I like that you mentioned YouTube, which is important because getting access to free content and is so so important especially at the start where I mean I know like why do you want to put money into it like do you know if the money's worth it like how do you know um, YouTube is such a great content um kind of source for that kind of thing and I think someone mentioned linear algebra sorry this is such a random shout out but three blue one brand does absolutely the best linear algebra course on YouTube and that is coming from someone yeah, exactly. who did 
a maths degree. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I graduated it and then listened to it, and I was like, oh my god, I get it now. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing. <laughs> But uh, I would like to add one more thing to this. Yeah, that, one as well. Uh, since the start of my career, I so the, like only relied on all of the free content that was available on the internet. I did not do any paid trainings. I did not do any paid courses. All of that I've learned is from YouTube and Google itself. That's like I think I needed to clear that up. And I mean, this actually leads itself into the next question perfectly because along with those accessibility parts comes into the community, and the community is such a good source of kind of whether it's getting content or actually meeting the people within the industry. It's such a good mix of everything and. But the way the world is going right now, we've gone all virtual, and that's become a lot more interconnected. Um, I guess, how have you found that? Um, like, how are you finding the fact that the communities are quite accessible? And if they're not, what can we do to make that a bit easier to get into? I guess. Um, maybe Rodanti, I'll give it to you first. <laughs> um, actually, I have the um, a very good experience with um, communities because um, it was during the first lockdown that I, I said okay I, I want to stay motivated I want to be a part of a group because everything was virtual it was also uh, a lot scarier because it was the beginning of a pandemic so there was also the, those emotions that okay what I want to do with my degree and all this um, um, all these thoughts so for me it was actually um a path that I needed to follow to be part of this community in order to um go through this this um quarantine and pandemic and this whole um very crucial um health um situation uh so uh, it really helped me because um I, I could un- see the projects that other people my age did from all over the world, and I could also work with them with a smaller project or bigger projects. Um, also connect with them via call, so I could see uh, people doing quarantine, which was also really uh, really nice. Um, I, but at the same time, another aspect that I noticed that I really really um, Found really value in it uh, in this in community, especially in tech community, is that I had the chance to um, be around a powerful and very talented uh, women tech um, uh, members uh, and also uh, mentors uh, that are that did so much in their in the tech world, and it's it is something that it's very crucial for. Um, A woman, a woman in tech. Uh, when you go in, in your uh, class, and your 10% of the class are um, only women, so uh, actually seeing how I could be in an environment that I could um, not have this issue that uh, that that is happening the last few years, um, and be actually um, in work with and have uh, work with so many other talented people and also have this m- men- like great mentor so I could see okay like in 10 years I can do uh, this kind of cool project like this um, very um, that, like my mentor for example so um, it was it was also really nice to see uh, an experience actually not only see this in paper also to be part of this community that ex- uh, accepted the basic um, uh, rights, if you can say this, uh, the, the, the basic um, um, things to be for women to be involved in tech projects and be not having to have any other issues, um, like doubting their um, capabilities and their uh, skills. So for me, it was very interesting because I could meet people, I could work on my skills, and I could have people to look up to. So I really recommend this if anyone has a chance in the university. I absolutely love that. Um, and I think, I mean, I can write like lyricists of poems and stuff around the fact that communities are great. 
but I think you put it really, really well. And um, maybe you can add even more flavor to it as well if you'd like. Okay, so uh, I absolutely agree with you guys. And especially speaking of my own region, uh, ever since the COVID started, uh, there have been a rise in communities uh, to include diverse spaces uh, for everyone. And I really like that because before the pandemic started, there was a lot of problems like uh, logistical issues, getting permission, uh, streaming stuff. And these sort of things were like the basic things which we take for granted right now. I still remember if you had to video call someone or had to interview someone, you had to use Skype and some other like tools which were like a lot of, uh, yeah, like it was a huge hassle. And then Microsoft hopped in and introduced uh, Microsoft Teams, which was a lifesaver for me as uh, an individual and as a community person and as a Microsoft Venture Ambassador. So uh, I personally believe that the communities are a great uh, place where we can uh, learn, grow, and build diverse spaces, not for, only for ourselves, but for others as well. And I think that uh, there are enough opportunities um, for people like us and for anyone who wants to work uh, in the community space. It's all about dedication and ambition. Awesome. Speaking of opportunities, do you think uh, there is enough opportunities um, for people within your region to land a job, especially in the field uh, of AI? Maybe we'll continue with you, Sman, and then we'll ask Rodanti the same question. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, you can say, one of the main questions that people are asking me right now, and my LinkedIn is filled uh, with that. And to be very honest, uh, AI jobs in my region are not enough because the field has been saturated a lot, uh, especially data science, if I might say. Uh, like every other university here is offering courses in data science and we are graduating almost uh, 100 to 200 people uh, from each university every six months. So the market is saturated a lot and not a lot of companies are working in AI data science and all of the other domains. Uh, so there are opportunities, but they are not enough to accommodate the people that are coming in into this field. And those who lost, uh, like there's usually competitiveness in uh, the AI domain, especially in our region and those who stand out. And obviously they get the job and they get the opportunities and they get themselves to grow. And the other people either switch domains or they go to somewhere else or either they go towards some other region. That is very interesting. I thought it would have, it could be the other way around. Like there are opportunities within like companies, but there aren't, there aren't a lot of people. But that is interesting to hear that the universities are kind of caught up with the, like a trend and they know that there is a gap within the industry and but not companies still uh, haven't. Yeah, uh, one more thing I would like to add to that. Uh, the field is saturated in a way that there are a lot of people who like to do data science, but they don't, they don't want to do it. And there are people who just like the AI, the buzzword and everything, but they don't want to put in the effort that is required to building an AI solution. So uh, I mainly think that uh, one of the, you can say major uh, issue towards that is the bad marketing because every other company is marketing AI stuff. And when you go to work for them, you realize that there is no AI involved in that specific product. And I think that uh, you can say uh, builds a bias in students who don't know the domain at all. And they just want to do AI just because it's something cool to do. And when they realize that how much effort and what's the real, uh, but how much effort is required in AI, they just usually think it's better to change the main than go towards that. That is, I think they're, they want to catch up, but they're slowing, slowly, slowly catching up. And so yeah. they get people on board it and they'll, for, for a time that when they have an opportunity or project that they need expertise on. That's very interesting. Uh, how about your region, Rodante? Is it the same case in your area or it's different? 
I think it's pretty similar in Greece. Um, from the um, conversations that we have uh, with my um, with other students in my university, they are all very interested in AI because it's, it is a very um, hot topic. So everyone just wants to be involved and work on projects. But from the um, um, the also the conversation um, continues and set, goes to that we don't have we cannot find internships or um, perhaps later a full time job to this area in um, in Greece as much as the people would like to be involved in this um, in this area. So it was more it's mostly research uh, and it's mostly uh, people that would like to continue this abroad because of the lack of opportunities here in this specific domain uh so but yeah but everyone like i think the same case goes uh, in in my university as well everyone wants to be involved with ai and everyone already works has works in some uh, small projects by themselves so i think that's very optimistic because if there are people who are willing to and want to work with AI tools, the job, the, the the market is going to understand this, and the market needs that. So it will fall, it will continue that in Greece as well. I think that's so so interesting to hear, especially in light of kind of when you think about Australia. I guess so. I mean, for our region, like it is the biggest skills shortage on earth at the moment. I think if you want to play it, like not just in necessarily AI, but like across the board, whether it's tech or outside of tech, I think it's just the great resignation has really hit hard. Um, and when you think about the skills that are already kind of niche, which is contemplatively AI <laughs> in Australia, it's just like the scarcest like um, industry for it at the moment. So this is good to hear, um, I guess, from that perspective of people in college who are coming out, you're like, no, 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 there's so many coming up the windows. This is great. Like there's so many more to come and join us. Um, but I think you mentioned this with Anthony where you're like, um, how does one start getting internships and like the market is getting saturated? How does one go about this? So I guess, and this is kind of a wrap up question a little bit as well. What do you think about um, what kind of skills can you use to help you kind of get ahead of the market a little bit ahead of that saturated market? Um, and has things like the student ambassador program and any other things that have really helped kind of push that forward a bit, I guess, for you? And the same will go to Osman as well. <laughs> I guess let's just get it through Rodanti first. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, for me, it was actually uh, two areas. Uh, first of all, is presenting, and I mean by what I mean by presenting is that being part of events, especially in the Microsoft program, um, I could. Um, work with a tool, understand the tool, create a small project, and then have the opportunity to present uh, present this tool, um, but in, uh, understand this more in depth, because when you are explaining some something to someone, you have to un know all the main aspects. Uh, and also really helped me to um, be, to be part of this community that is willing to hear for example, my student ambassador event about a specific tool. So th there is also this networking that is really, really helpful through this um, very interesting um, presentations. And the other uh, aspect that really, I think, um, helped me with this whole journey is uh, also the certifications. We talked about this before, of course, a certification or a course, it's not it's it's not a key it's not a, an indication that you know um, everything about this area uh, but at the same time when you have when you work to get a certification uh, to learn all the uh, information needed it's very it's it's it is a very uh, interesting experience also from the technical view of course um, but also it is nice to have um, uh, a way of saying I know about this area. So in the in, in internship later or in, in a job after university, um, it will be easier for um, to prove in a way in the company along with your project that you have created because those two things go hand in hand like go at the same time. So projects and certifications in order to implement the things that you learn from the certifications to those projects. So and 
for example, my experience are from Azure certifications um, and also an AI, Azure AI certification was really, really helped me. Um, but I think if you work with this kind of um, um, skill, like work with, uh, have certifications, um, present if you have the chance to learn more in, uh, in depth and also meet people, it will be very easy easier for you to um, have a, not a, a better chance, but it, ha your path to ha get a leadership will be perhaps easier. That's pretty accurate, I think, in fairness as well. Like, we're even yeah. I'll definitely meet so many people at our meetups and often they're like, hey, I'm trying to do this. And I'm like, well, you're the first person I've heard who's trying to do this. So let's go try it. <laughs> um, so, like, I mean, reach out to all the people, like, ping them all, get on to everyone. If they don't reply, so be it. They won't remember you. If they do, there's an in. <laughs> uh, Usman, maybe do you want to hit it up um, and tell us what you found that might help? Um, can you repeat the question? Uh, great question. I'm also just trying to remember the question as I was saying it. <laughs> uh, but essentially, I know the market is quite saturated, but is there anything that can actually help put yourself ahead of the market? Uh, okay. Uh, one word, digital presence. Now you can make that uh, via different things. You can be active on LinkedIn. You can, as uh, all we talked about uh, in the entire podcast, you make projects, but how does your employer or how does someone else or a contributor uh, see those projects? That's one of the major points. People do not know how to present their projects. So one of the good ways to present it is on GitHub. Uh, deploy your projects uh, either on some Microsoft Azure or some hosting. There are a bunch of free hosting or put it on GitHub in a well-formatted way. And then like, uh, add it to your LinkedIn and like market to the right people. That's, I think, that uh, one of the major things that people miss. I think that's very accurate, especially at that age of getting started into it. It's like, well, no one wants to hear what I have to say because I'm just in college. Yes, we do. We 100% want to hear what you have to say because clearly there's people in college doing better things than I apparently will ever do at this stage um but look we might have to wrap it up there like thank you so much for jumping in and sharing all your experiences I think I'm like so me I don't know about you but I'm just like one day I will be able to do the things I've already done <laughs> no I'm with you on that one I wish I could do the university all over again I would have done it differently <laughs> exactly this is so great to hear and it's so so good to hear there's so many more um absolutely fabulous people coming into the industry uh, from the sense of it. So look, we'll leave you, get back to your days, go break more barriers and do more AI projects and come back and tell us all about them in the future. Um, we'll be back again next month with another episode of the Global AI Podcast. Until then, folks, we don't know if the world will have ended by then, but I hope it hasn't. I hope keep safe in the meantime. Um, our thoughts and prayers are with obviously everyone um, currently suffering whether that's out in ukraine or in the brisbane floods um we will see you all soon take care and take safe and take safe keep safe <laughs> that would be a good ending <laughs> thanks a lot goodbye everyone <laughs>